If you would open your Bibles to the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 2, verse 19 through 23 this morning. We have the privilege of peering into one of the great New Testament relationships this morning in this section of Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, verse 19. And as we read, as always, I want to encourage us to remember this is God's Word. This is God the Almighty and Gracious speaking to us, calling us to Himself and to obedience to him. Let's enjoy his word, beginning in verse 19. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. May the Lord bless the preaching of his word. Next year, in 2020, my grandfather, Jerry Payne, will turn 90 years old. I have many cherished memories of him family reunions and Christmases at Grandpa and Grandma's house, seeing him smiling through a greeting on our wedding video, listening to him laugh at some joke from one of his four sons or daughters-in-law. But one of my fondest memories of my grandfather takes me back to when I was a young boy visiting his house, probably with aunts and uncles and cousins crammed into bedrooms and on couches, And while most everyone else still slept, I watched him rising very early, quietly lay out the bowls and spoons on the table for the family's breakfast. In my young eyes, there was something magical about watching the founder of this family, intelligent, educated, respectable, getting up so much earlier than was necessary, preparing for everyone else's day. My grandfather was a doctor for 40 plus years. He was intelligent, educated, and by many measures, quite successful. But what sets him apart to me is his generosity and his determination to use his life to serve others. To this day, He labors in the food pantry at his church and diligently prioritizes that work to make sure that his church is serving the needy in his community. I have no doubt that he will not stop serving until the very end of his life. Servanthood defines him. I think that is Paul's hope for the Philippians as he writes various passages in this letter. One of his goals is that servanthood would define them. One of God's goals, as he writes this letter to us, is that servanthood would define us. Going all the way back to chapter 1, you can see Paul's servant-hearted disposition. He's so captured by Christ that regardless of suffering, regardless of antagonism, he is determined to serve, even, even, even to the point where he is willing to remain behind on this earth because that is what would be in the best interest of the Philippian church. Though his desire is to depart and be with Christ, he is willing to keep serving because the church still needs him. And then he calls the Philippians in chapter 2 to not count their own interests more important than the interests of others. And then he describes Christ as the ultimate servant of all 
who does not count equality with God a thing to be used to his own advantage, but lays his life down to serve his people. And now we come to verse 18, and Paul is going to pick up this theme again by commending two different servants, Timothy, which we'll study this week, and then Epaphroditus, which we'll study next week. And this commendation of Timothy is is much more than just an introduction to a Christian leader that Paul will be sending to visit this church on his behalf. It does more than just get something practical done. Paul is putting Timothy forward as an example of the kind of person that is affected by the gospel, the kind of person for whom Christ is their life will look like Timothy. And Timothy and Epaphroditus serve as these kind of ordinary but extraordinary examples of what it means when a person is so captivated by Christ that their life is defined by serving others. Gordon Fee, the commentator, says this, The explanatory commendation of Timothy has the gospel as its underlying current, becoming explicit at the end of verse 22. The content of verses 20 to 22, the commendation of Timothy, suggests that along with himself and Christ, Timothy is also being set forth as something of a paradigm. In other words, this is not just practical. This has the intention of having an effect on the Philippian church. As Gordon Fee also says, Paul's description of Timothy, listen to this, lies at the heart of what Paul understands Christian life to be all about. It lies at the heart of what Paul understands the Christian life to be all about. Now, that should motivate us to pay very close attention to what Paul says about Timothy. If he says it lies at the heart, Paul's description of this, this young minister, it lies at the heart of what he understands the Christian life to be. What it means to be captivated by Christ could be described by this commendation of Timothy. So we should pay very close attention. We're going to organize our study of this passage into two groups, sending Timothy and then commending Timothy. Sending Timothy and commending Timothy. And I trust the result will be that we will be convinced and motivated that a life devoted to Christ is a life dedicated to serving others. A life devoted to Christ is a life dedicated to serving others. Let's begin looking at this category of sending Timothy that opens and closes this paragraph. You notice at the beginning and the end of the paragraph, Paul expresses this hope. Notice in verse 19 and in verse 23, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon. And then he picks it up again in verse 23. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And then I also trust, he says in the Lord, that I myself will come also. He wants to send Timothy. And we want to take note of this, this desire to send Timothy uh, as an example in and of itself. Remember, Paul is currently in the custody of the Romans. He is suffering both through his unjust trial at their hands and also because there is a kind of selfish ambition taking place among gospel preachers in Rome who are looking to take advantage of his imprisonment for their own advancement in ministry. And yet, Paul's heart is with the Philippians. So much so that he wants to send this man to find out about their well-being, to be cheered, he says, by news of you. It seems likely if you progress uh, that that Paul's going to send the letter, and then he's going to send Timothy afterwards, probably to find out, is the letter having an effect? Are they continuing to stand firm, as I instructed them to do? Are they uh, holding on to the gospel rather than giving in to fear on account of the persecution? So he, he wants to send Timothy and then hear back from Timothy, apparently, about how the Philippian church is doing. Here's the point I want to make. In Paul's suffering, one of his greatest goals is to hear about the well-being of the Philippian church. Let's just let that sink in for a moment. In Paul's suffering, his heart is caught up with 
a desire to know about the well-being of the Philippian church and to send one of his most faithful and trusted servants to also aid in that well-being. Paul is on trial. He does not know with absolute certainty what the outcome will be. He is facing a, a certain struggle or animosity among other Christians, even in Rome, which um, um, certainly was discouraging for him. And yet he wants to send his most trusted companion and leader to serve this church and so that he can hear back from this church about their well-being. He says, I hope in the Lord Jesus. I think that's an expression of his submission to the will of the Lord and also his confidence that the Lord Jesus is able to bring this about, that he will be able to send Timothy so that he can hear news of them. And he wants to be cheered by this news. And at the end of the letter, he says, I hope therefore to send him as soon as I see how it will go with me. So apparently Paul's going to sort of find out the trajectory of the trial so that Timothy can take that news. And then as soon as he finds out, he's going to send Timothy. And he also has this hope of coming himself. He hopes that the Lord will allow him and make it possible for him to go to serve this church. Listen, the apostle is so focused on the glory of Christ that it motivates him to, to have a, a heart dedicated to the well-being of this church. He's not primarily concerned with his own suffering, with the outcome of his trial, with the injustice that has been foisted upon him. He's not primarily concerned about that. He's concerned about the Philippians. We've seen this all the way back to the beginning of the uh, chapter 1 where Paul says, My heart is full of you. I hold you in my heart with full affection. I, I rejoice in your partnership in the gospel. I long and yearn for you, he says. Now, we need to learn, here is servanthood revealed in a, 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 an attentiveness to the well-being of others. Before we even get to Timothy, there's something to learn about how the gospel should affect our perspective, our view of life, because too often the temptation is that our heart and our mind and our, our mental energy is caught up with our well-being. How are we doing? How are we making progress? What's going on in our life? What pain are we experiencing? How's our progress? But, but Paul's concern is the well-being of this church. He is not, we might say, distracted by his own interests. He's caught up in the well-being of others. Let, let me just ask us to put our servanthood, the effect of the gospel, to this test. In a difficult moment, are you longing to hear good news of someone else's progress? In our difficult moments, are we longing to hear good news of someone else's spiritual progress? Is that part of what even helps us in our suffering? You can mark selfishness by the indifference to the good news or the spiritual progress of someone else and a dedication to focusing on your own news. I, I had a friend many, many years ago who was young, I think, in the Lord and, and was just kind of growing in his maturity. And one of the marks of his immaturity uh, was that he, he found it quite easy to talk at great length about what was going on in his own life. Uh, it was remarkable, actually, uh, how long and thoroughly he could discuss things he was facing at work and how he was doing and what he was developing and his projects and so on and so forth. And, and it, it stretched uh, patience to the limit uh, to listen at that length of what was going on in his life and, and to focus. And I, and I thought, this is, this is not a mark of maturity, how long this individual can talk about themselves. But in all honesty, I might not have been so new to the faith that I would talk that much, but my mind often spends at least that much time thinking about myself, my trials, my difficulties, my struggles, my interests, my dreams, my hopes, my disappointments, my offenses. I can find myself wondering if I'm making progress in my reputation, in my friendships, in my my stature, 
How am I doing? Am I, am I moving forward? There can be a, a kind of a self-centeredness. And Paul's a, a key point in this letter is to, to move the Philippians away from that kind of thinking. To say, look, for those who have, have come to Jesus Christ, there should be this outward focus that is genuinely delighted by the progress of others. So let's put our, our absorption of the gospel to this test. Are we genuinely delighted by the progress of others? Are we delighted by it? Does it just cause us to beam with joy at the, the celebration of, oh, there is, there is progress being made. I, I, am, I am cheered by news of you. I, I am not focused on myself. I am focused on your well-being. I am, I am delighted to hear. Let's, let's think, for example, of, of wives as they relate to their husbands. Are you cheered by the spiritual progress? Whether or not it has anything to do with benefit to you. Husbands for your wife, parents for your children. Are you cheered by progress? What about people that have nothing to do directly with you and your situation? People around the world, the global mission updates. Are they, are they something you long to hear? That you would go out of your way and maybe even send one of your best friends in a moment of trial just to get that news? When you go to community group, do, do you go eager for news of spiritual progress? Eager for news of someone making progress in the faith? So that you're cheered and you go home thinking, we didn't talk about me at all. I love hearing how God is moving in the lives of these brothers and sisters. We can test our maturity in servanthood by this measure. Are we genuinely cheered by news of them? And if we're not, there's a, there's a very a simple step to begin to make progress to be like Paul in this way. We can begin to ask questions about their progress and then discipline our soul to rejoice with them in the progress that the Lord is making in their soul. One of the things I've, I've thought over the years we've talked about as pastors that is, is a, a key reason for people to attend a community group structure or some kind of a, a gathering of Christians is so that they can be made aware of and focused on the well-being of others. Because naturally, we, we tend to kind of spiral inward on ourselves. Left to ourselves, we are naturally uninterrupted in a self-centered stream of consciousness. But when we break into an interaction with others, we're forced to evaluate and to celebrate and to consider that God is at work in others and we should be celebrating that. We should be like Paul, cheered by news of you. Paul's desire to send Timothy to both serve and receive news from this church, his desire to go there himself indicates the other-centeredness that is the result of making Christ your life. You can't belong to the Savior who gave himself for people and not love people. I have a dear friend in Phoenix who I worked with for years named Trey Richardson. He's been a pastor now for 30 years, over 30 years. And in his office, uh, he kept a picture of himself and one of his sons at, at one of his son's basketball games when he was a, a teenager. Obviously, something good had just happened uh, because Trey, in this picture, he has his arms wrapped around this son, and the way the camera angle is, you can just see his face, this is his dad face, just beaming. I mean, from ear to ear, this like Moses smile, gleaming face as he's wrapped around this, this son. Something obviously had just happened. And that, that picture stays with me. The look on his face stays with me because it was a face that revealed a heart captivated by the progress of someone else. Just beaming at what was happening in someone else's life. And I thought, isn't that just like Paul? Just wanting to celebrate what God is doing in someone else's life. It reveals a heart that has become more and more one with Jesus Christ. There's a lot we can learn from Paul's description of his desire to send Timothy. But we can also learn from his commendation 
of Timothy. Sending Timothy is point one. Commending Timothy is point two. Notice here that Paul says four in verse 20. Four, if you're wanting to break down a Bible text, these connection words are very important. They, They show the relationship between the passage. Four in verse 20, I have no one like him. Why do I want to send Timothy? Why? Because I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. This is why I want to send him. The phrase, no one like him, the Greek tends to to push in the direction of an idea of of likeness of soul. I have no one with likeness of soul. And probably what Paul is referring to here is that there's no one quite like Timothy that is this similar to me in his love and affection for the Philippian church. I, I have no one that is like me in his love for you. Might be one way to put it. I, I, I've looked around, and here is this man that he will be like me in his love for you. I have no one who is like me, except for Timothy, who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. So what, what marks Timothy out as the perfect emissary for Paul is his genuine concern. This is not a superficial concern. This is not merely a professional concern. This isn't just his job. He is genuinely, he is truly at the heart level concerned for the well-being of the Philippian church. He is genuinely concerned for your welfare. And this is in contrast with others that Paul might have sent in verse 21 who all seek their own interests. Notice verse 21 there. Probably Paul's not talking about every Christian everywhere or all Christians in Rome. Probably he's speaking of some group that might have been sent. Obviously, he can't be referring to Epaphroditus because he's about to commend him. He's talking about some group that might have been sent, and yet, as Paul evaluates them, he finds them to be Christian ministers in name, but selfish at heart level. They are Christian ministers in name. They they should be able to go, but at the heart level, they are concerned, he says, about their own interest. They're wanting to advance their own name rather than advance the name of Jesus Christ. And we put all this together. This is some profound statements about servanthood that Paul is making here. Paul is saying that it is possible for a person to be a Christian in name, even a Christian minister, and yet be seeking their own interests. That even in the, in the course of ministry, a person can be advancing their own cause, can be looking out for themselves, and the most condemning part of this whole passage is doing that is not just failing to serve others, it's failing to serve Jesus. You see that connection here? See, see what Paul is saying? They, they serve their own interests, unlike Timothy who's concerned for your well-being, and ultimately, in their selfishness, who are they not serving? Not just others, but Jesus Christ. In other words, it is Christ's interests in the Philippian church that motivates Paul and Timothy. It is Christ's desire for the well-being of that church. It is Christ's heart for their progress in the gospel that motivates Paul and Timothy. Paul and Timothy are not just nicer guys than the average. No, they are tied together with the interests of Christ, which is for his church. And so to not desire to serve that church or to serve your own interests is not just to fail in servanthood to people. It's to fail to serve Jesus Christ. Failing to serve brothers and sisters in the church is a failure to serve Jesus Christ. That's the logic of the passage. The reverse is also true. Serving brothers and sisters in Christ is serving the interests of Christ. What does Christ want, we might ask of this passage? What does Christ want? Christ wants his people to serve one another. If you are doing that, you are serving his interests. If you are not doing that, you are not serving his interests. That's another way we could put the language here. Paul marks out Timothy because he sees a number of people who are Christian in name. They are ministers, but they are motivated selfishly. And he sees in that a terrible, devastating revelation that they are they're replacing their own name and interests with with the interests of Jesus Christ. It's possible that we might demote servanthood 
away from its, its vertical component. Here's what I mean by that. We might think of servanthood as something to do if we have time to do it that is separate from our identity in Jesus. So we, we love Jesus, but servanthood is this other thing we do if we have time for it or if we feel up to it, if we're not too tired or school didn't take too long or our chores weren't too burdensome. But Paul says, no, serving others is the way in which you serve Christ. You you can't separate a personal devotion to Christ from the servanthood of his people. Uh, That would be as ridiculous as if, let's imagine a scenario where dear friends of mine are playing with me in the park and their children are there and my children are there and I see one of their children wander off towards some dangerous area, the street, say. And I'm engaging in conversation with my friends, their parents, and I'm thinking, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just, this is my friend. I'm, I'm, I care about them. I want to keep listening to what they're saying and, and pay attention. We're having fellowship right now. And all the while, their child is wandering towards danger. But no, you, you can't separate a love for this person and a love for those that they love. What would love for this person look like in that moment? Well, rescuing their child. What would be the the most affectionate, loving, servant-hearted, relational thing I could do rather than continuing to talk, say, oh, my little little dude is, is in danger. And I'll go rescue them. Love for this person must be reflected in love for those that they love. That's what Paul is saying. If you love Christ you must reveal it in love for his people. If I love Christ, I must reveal it in love for his people. This is what Paul is commending Timothy for and distinguishing him from some of these others who apparently, though they are ministers, are seeking their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. It's a devastating word to those that Paul has seen in perhaps in this Roman church. We might think, if we go back to the sports analogy, imagine someone who is there on the bench in a game, and they are supposed to be ready to serve their team, and yet they are selfish, and so they can't be taken off the bench because they would actually only be serving their own interests. Perhaps you've heard the phrase, throwing a game. You ever heard that phrase? When an athlete uh, does something to undermine his own team, usually because there's some bet being made on the game and he's made a private financial contract where if he intentionally misses a shot or, or you know, does something harmful to his team, then he'll get some private money at the end. Paul sees in some of these Christians that motive. He's saying, you're on the bench, you're, you're supposed to be serving the interests of this team, but I'm aware that your interests are actually selfish. And those selfish interests mean I I can't use you where you should be used. How devastating for a Christian to not be useful precisely because they have decided to focus primarily on their own interests. How devastating for a Christian who has this moment of opportunity to advance the gospel and yet cannot because they've devoted themselves to their own interests. How devastating to know that selfishness can sideline us from the kingdom of God. The unwillingness to serve others can bench us when a moment comes that we could be called on to serve. This is the devastating critique of some who are in Rome. And yet Timothy stands out. Paul sees his son in the faith, Timothy, and he says, look, there there is one. He's not concerned about his own name. He's not concerned about his own reputation. He's not concerned about his own rights and dignity and how he's measuring up with others. No, he's concerned about Jesus. He's not concerned about any of these other things. I can send to him. I know he will do whatever is best for the kingdom and to the glory of Christ and for the well-being of this church. I know he will do what I would do. He will do, we might even say, what Christ would do. I can send him. So he commends him. The commendation continues because this servanthood is not just temporary. He says, you know Timothy's proven worth. How as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. Paul Paul loves this child father 
analogy. We, we talked about it a couple weeks ago where he, he uses this phrase not just to talk about the, the genesis of Timothy's salvation. He, he's also talking about the reflection that a true child should be of his father. You've all seen how, how cute it is when like a little kid just wants to totter after their, their father or a parent and, and imitate them in some way. You're working, Daddy, I want to work with you. You're hammering, I want to hammer with you. I had to instruct my, my son recently that, no, we, we, we don't use a screwdriver directly into the wall, son. That's, I, I appreciate you're trying to fix the wall, but that's, that's not how we use it. But what's he trying to do? He's just trying to imitate, isn't he? He's trying to be a child with me. He's trying to, to, to reflect. That's what Paul sees in Timothy. This honest desire to be like a father, to be that kind of loyal, reflecting, honorable son serving with a father in this gospel mission. So Paul pictures the gospel as this great sphere of work in which they are all operating in Timothy, right by his side, laboring, right along with him, imitating to the best of his ability what the apostle would do in each situation. And he says, Philippians, you know this of Timothy, so I'm sending him to you as someone who has this proven track record. This is not a, a temporary servant. This is a permanent servant. This isn't a, a servant who serves while it's convenient. He serves in the ups and the downs and the thick and in the thin. When times are good and times are awkward, he continues to be loyal to Paul, even as Paul faces false accusations and, and troubling conflict in the midst of the church in Rome. He continues to serve with Paul. He seems to be willing to go to the end in servanthood. And he says, you know this about him. He's like a son with a father. He has served with me in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him. Because of who he is, because of his love for Christ Jesus and his determination to reflect Paul's manner of servant-hearted ministry, he is the one Paul would send. Because he is the one that can actually do good for this church. Now, no wonder this is the case. Those who seek their own interests are not seeking the interests of Jesus Christ. The reverse, we've learned, is also true. Timothy is seeking the interests of Jesus Christ. As Gordon Fee had said, the gospel is the current. It's the current of this servanthood. Someone who has jumped into the gospel current is just carried along in this manner of service. That's what happened to Timothy. Timothy has been captivated by the person and work of Jesus Christ. He has absorbed who Jesus is in Philippians 2, the one who did not count even equality with God a thing to use to his own advantage, but instead came and offered his life up to rescue sinners. And Timothy says, in light of that being my Savior, I must give my life to serve others. Because of Christ laying his life down, Christians must lay their life down. Because of the one we worship being the one who died in our place, Christians must be willing to die in service to those that Christ died to save. Let's, let's consider how outrageous it is when you or I choose to not serve or to serve our own interests. Consider first who we are serving. We are serving this one for whom Christ died. So will Christ die for them and I cannot pick up after them? Will Christ die for them and I won't open my home to them? Will Christ die for them and I won't bear their burdens of their, their obnoxious inconsistencies or their sinfulness? Will Christ carry the load of their guilt and I will not carry the load of their moving need? Will Christ carry their, their sin all the way to the grave and I will not carry them in a moment of weakness? Consider how absurd it is when our heart is focused on ourselves rather than on these ones for whom Christ died. That's what Paul is saying. He's saying selfishness is an outright denial of the nature of our salvation. Not that we are saved by our service, but as Spurgeon says, we are saved to service. We become like what we worship. If we worship Christ, the self-sacrificing Savior, 
then we will certainly become self-sacrificing ourselves. If we are not currently self-sacrificing, or to be more realistic, to the degree we are not currently self-sacrificing, the solution is also present in this passage. What do those selfish ministers in Rome need to do? Well, the first thing they need to do is go back to their understanding of Christ Jesus and the gospel. If I were to counsel those ministers who have missed this moment, it's gone. It's, it's gone now. They have missed their moment. They had a moment they could have served. It is now gone. It is over. I was talking to one of my children recently who, who was delaying his willingness to finish a meal. And then later on, he changed his mind, and he, he wanted to go back and, and finish it later. I said, son, you, you've missed your moment. That was the moment. <laughs> and now the moment is gone. Well, these guys have missed this moment. And God doesn't give us, unfortunately, do-overs. But he often does give us new opportunities. So this moment is gone for them, sadly, and eternally. But there are new opportunities. And if I was counseling them, I would say, look, look, here's the problem. The problem isn't first that you don't love the Philippians well enough yet, or even first that you're too consumed with yourself. It is first that you have lost your grip on the message of Jesus Christ and him crucified. Go back there and study the mystery of those wounds. Go back there and gaze at the God-man suffering in your place. Go back there and meditate on the one who laid down the glories of heaven to take up the dust of earth. Meditate on that and then turn your gaze and consider the ones for whom Christ died and allow selfishness to be exposed for the evil that it is and denounce it, renounce it, and move into a Christ-centered manner of living. Brothers, sisters, let me encourage you, I would say to them. Let me encourage you. Let's go to the cross together. Let's consider how selfishness needed to be crucified in Christ. And having been crucified, we can now serve others. We were set free from selfishness in order to serve the one who died to save us and to serve those whom he also died to save so what should you do if you see in your heart more self-interest than the interest of Christ in the serving of his people? Go back to this Christ who has saved you. Search the mystery of his wounds. Gaze on the nature of the God that we worship. And consider, given that that's who he is, what must we be? As Spurgeon says, we are not saved by service, but we are saved to service. Gordon Fee again says, It is hard to imagine a more certain antidote to any number of struggles that consistently plague the local church, not to mention larger bodies and denominations, than this one that God's people all be as Timothy in terms of their putting the interests of others as the matter of first importance. Here again, the way of humility, taking the lower road by way of the cross, is on full display. And here alone, as the gospel impacts the people of God in this way, at the core of our beings, can we expect truly to count for the gospel? God is is eager to use humble Christians, servant-hearted because they've gazed long at Christ at Calvary. Now, what gets in the way? What gets in the way of a faithful track record of servanthood? What gets in the way of you and I being like Timothy, where we can be as a son with a father, serving over the long term, sacrificially, not counting our own interests? What, what gets in the way? Well, for me, sometimes I will serve as long as I think I am being served or likely to be served. I will serve as, as long as I am being served or likely to be served. But the moment I detect that service is not likely to be returned, my servant-hearted motivation dries up very quickly. 
That happens in my marriage. As, as long as I, I have some sense that this is an exchange and I'm, I'm tallying things and they, they seem to be fairly equal, then I continue to be eager to serve because it's in my interest to serve. I will encourage as long as I'm encouraged. I will, I will give up something that I like as long as you will also give something that you like. I will host if you will host. Uh, there's this exchange that takes place. I'll serve as long as I can sense or guess that I will continue to be served. When I notice others not serving, my desire to serve turns into defensiveness and self-righteousness. How dare you? Comes to my mind, to my lips. How dare you demand that I serve? Don't you know how you haven't served me? That, that happened this week. I had a conversation this week with a family member who was pointing out some ways I haven't served, and I thought, well, I can point out ways you haven't served either. What, what immediately comes into my mind is, okay, if we're going to be even. Is there anything wrong with trying to help someone see how they can serve? No, of course not. But not if my motive is, let's be clear, this is all going to be even. Not if we're Christians. We are not balancers. We're Christians. We're not moral accountants. We're Christians. Sometimes I think as Christians, we almost think more, this, there should be kind of a yin-yang of servanthood, okay? Uh, it, it's all even. <laughs> you serve and I serve, and we all serve together, and it's delightful. No, we're Christians. We're called to serve, not to be served. Even as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You notice it's interesting that when Christ calls a Christian, he doesn't call him to sickness or weakness only. He calls him to death. There's a very important metaphor there. Jesus doesn't say, unless a grain of wheat uh, lays on the ground and feels limited, uh, he shall remain alone. Notice that's not how he, he says it, right? Unless the grain of wheat um, chips off a bit of itself and tithes a degree of his servant-heartedness, he will remain alone. No, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, he remains alone. If you would follow me, take up your inconvenience. No, take, take up your somewhat more limited schedule. No, take up your what? Cross. You know what happens on a cross? People die. He died. I don't like dying. I get weakness. I get kind of inconvenience, but dying but this is the way of Christ. And if it is the way of Christ who is the way, we must follow that way to the end. You know Timothy's proven worth. As a son with a father, he has served with me, not seeking his own interests, but those of Jesus Christ who died for his people. Sometimes I serve even sacrificially, as long as it doesn't intrude on certain preserved parts of my life. So this is the idea of, you can have everything but this, servanthood. <laughs> Listen, I will, I, whatever you want, just not, it reminds me of like when, when, <laughs> when we were kids and, and you had, uh, you ever do those presidential physical fitness things? Um, we had to do those and, and, you know, you had people that they were good at a lot of stuff, but just the one thing, you know, was just, Look, I'll do everything, but don't make me run the mile. Or I'll do everything, but the V-sit and reach is just ridiculous. I'll do everything, but just please can we not do the sprint. That's a little bit how we, we relate to servanthood sometimes. Look, I'll, I'll do everything, but I've got to have the hour as soon as I get home. I'll, I'll do everything, but I've got to have the hour as soon as you get home. I'll, I'll do everything but not late at night. I'll do everything but not early in the morning. I'll, I'll do everything but not hosting. I'll do everything but not giving. I'll, I'll do everything. I'll do everything but is not the way of Christ. 
Sometimes I'll serve as long as it's popular, but not when it's unpopular. Have you ever had the experience that your servanthood is counted as selfishness? Boy, that's a, that's a hard burden. You don't even get honored for actually serving? Sometimes even your serving is distasteful to others and they critique you for the very thing you were doing to serve? Sometimes I'll serve as long as that doesn't happen. I'll serve as long as at least it's acknowledged as servanthood. There might be others. Th those are the ones that most resonate with me. As I think about how I think naturally when I'm coming home, when I'm in the workplace, when I'm interacting with people, I, I think those objections come to my mind. I'll serve as long as we're even. That, that's fine. I'll, I'll do that. I'll serve as long as I can preserve this certain prioritized area in my life, some treasured thing or value or option. I, I want to preserve that. I'll serve anywhere else. Or I'll serve as long as it's recognized or popular. Let us go back to the cross of this Christ Jesus and take those objections and lay them at his feet. Is there any objection that can't be laid at the foot of the Savior who is suffering in our place? Can be laid down before his nail-scarred hands and offered up to him in willing and joyful sacrifice? Shouldn't I go back to him as I consider my, my prideful defensiveness, I've served enough, and, and shouldn't I lay at his feet these objections and say, how, how outrageous, Lord Jesus, that I would object in these ways when you died for me. How outrageous to preserve my time when you did not preserve your life, my dignity when you did not preserve, Lord, the recognition of your deity. How outrageous for me to say I must be acknowledged in my service when you were mocked on the cross. Let me lay it down in repentance and then gladly take up the cross you have given me in honor to you. Listen, brothers and sisters, when we are serving people for Christ, we are serving Christ. This snapshot of Timothy and this rebuke of those around Timothy in the Roman church is intended to motivate us. As Fee says, it's a paradigm of what Paul expects the gospel to do in every Christian heart. And thankfully, because we serve a Savior who died for selfish sinners, selfish sinners like you and me don't have to live in a hopelessness over our selfishness. We can be forgiven of it and move forward in grateful and glad service to Him. What does the servanthood of Christ call us to in this season? Well, certainly to believe, first of all, that he has forgiven us of every moment of selfishness that has taken place in our lives this week, this year, this lifetime. What good news that is, that we will not face God covered by our selfishness, but instead by the righteousness of his servanthood. Do you know that the obedience of Christ in dying on the cross is your reputation before God and not your latest selfishness? Isn't it good to know that you stand before God as a Christian covered by the absolute to the death servanthood of Jesus Christ? What good news that is. What kind of confidence should a son or daughter have with a father who has served to the death and that is exactly your reputation if you are a Christian? And having that reputation before God, should we not go to him boldly and lay down our selfishness and take up servanthood in every opportunity that he gives us? What servanthood has Christ called us to in this season? Is it to be sent to a foreign mission field to face possible arrest and danger for the sake of the gospel? Perhaps. Perhaps it is. Is it to consider a, a future church plant that would cause us to take a pay cut and move away from dear friends? Perhaps. Someday it would be. Is to go back into a household of young, unconverted, or immature children to seek to win their hearts for Jesus and face their grumbling bravely and without anger. 
perhaps for many of us, that is precisely it. Is it to go back into a marriage conversation where we lay down our defense of ourselves and take up the interest of our spouse's burdens? Is it to go to the home of a suffering fellow church member with a meal or a cheerful encouragement? Is it to lay down our offenses and take up a burden-bearing disposition? Let us follow Christ into this field of service, loving him by loving his people, ready to be sent anywhere and do anything at home or abroad for the sake of Jesus Christ. Those devoted to Christ are dedicated to serving his people. Because Christ has forgiven our selfishness, we can take up servanthood for the sake of his name. Let's pray. Lord, I ask first that you would bring conviction to our hearts wherever we have been clinging to our own interests. Lord, wherever we've been caught up in our own progress, Lord, would you penetrate even perhaps years of blindness in this area? Lord, there there may be, in in all of us, areas where we're not even aware of how instinctively we think about every situation in terms of ourselves. Lord, reveal that to us. And Lord, grant the reassuring confidence of your forgiveness. Lord, our servanthood can't pay for our selfishness. Only you can. So we receive your payment in our behalf. And Lord, motivate us to serve. Motivate us, Lord, to seize the new opportunities given to us this week to serve, to lay down our lives for you. Lord, I pray... in a particular way for marriages that you would cause husbands to gladly serve the interests of their wife. That their concern would be for her well-being. That her spiritual progress would capture their attention and their productivity. Lord, I pray for wives that they would serve the interests of their husbands. That they would lay down any defensiveness or self-righteousness. That they would serve you by serving him. I pray for children, young people, youth that still live at home. Lord, reveal right now in every heart where there is a self-centeredness of life. Lord, I want to pray in particular for young teenage boys. I pray that you would right now bring a conviction of servanthood. I pray, Lord, that you would cleanse them from self-centeredness. You would bring them to the foot of your cross. Redeem any who don't know you and convert them to a life of serving you. Lord, may this be a church filled with young men 
who are humble servants. Please do this, Lord Jesus, I pray. Lord, for anybody here who doesn't know you as Savior, reveal yourself to them right now. Perhaps for the first time, may they see you dying in their place and believe in you. May they see your humble glory and be drawn to you. Do this by the power of your spirit, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.